Yeah, it's your boy Chili here. Welcome back to Nano Ceph. I got a little a little treat for you. Next, I'd say two videos are gonna get a little spicy, a little picante, because we're gonna be solving a problem. It it took me a little while to figure this out. There's like multiple parts to it, so it's a real it's a real systems engineering puzzle here for you. R only real engineers need apply. Well, what am I talking about? So let's let's recap. In the last video, we connected the C++ world to the JavaScript TypeScript world and so we can click this button and that causes some C++ code to get executed and opens this system dialog and that's that's pretty cool right if we press yes and the result goes back to the JavaScript world and we see that in the UI but uh, something interesting happens if you just leave this dialog open for a while yeah, this other dialog pops up, uh, and it says the page is unresponsive. And I mean, we've probably all seen this at some point while using Chrome, just like surfing the interweb. You'll go to some website, and then it'll pop this, and that's, a, that's an indication that the person who wrote the website kind of sucks at writing JavaScript, um, because they froze the engine. And if you press exit page, well, then you get this. You probably don't want this in your application on the desktop. Uh, but what's going on here? Like, what's the problem? Well, it's not difficult to understand. You could probably figure it out without any extra hints if you understand how certain scripted languages like JavaScript and Python generally work. So they handled the problem of thread synchronization, concurrency. Like that's a big problem, right? It causes a lot of bugs, causes a lot of a lot of heartache, a lot of nights spent shitting the bed in terror. One way to solve the problem of synchronizing multiple threads is say, okay, no multiple threads, only one thread for you. And that's how JavaScript works, at least on the browser. I don't know if it's actually baked into the language, but certainly on the web browser, you got one thread. That thread is running everything. It's not only running all your JavaScript code, it's also running the Blink engine, which is the thing that is updating and you know issuing the draw calls for the UI. So if you do something stupid, like you create a JavaScript that is going to have an infinite loop that never exits, that's gonna freeze your page. It's gonna freeze everything about the page, not, not just that one script. It's gonna freeze the animations, everything. And that's essentially what we've done because we've created a script that calls this bound function that executes message box, which is gonna block until you click the button. So if you don't click the button, then you froze the whole page and eventually Chrome is just like another thread of Chrome is kind of just sitting there like, hmm, when's this motherfucker going to finish his task? And it's like, he's not finishing. So put a little thing on the screen asking the user, do you want to like kill this mofo? So what's the solution here? Well, clearly like this sucks and JavaScript is bad and we must just throw it all in the garbage because we, we need lots of threads. No, this is actually a really good strategy for you know synchronizing your data and making sure you don't have data races is you just have one thread that is allowed to access the resources and if other threads need something to happen with those resources they post a task to that thread and that's how stuff gets happened so this is not bad it's a pretty good strategy in many cases uh, but we need a way of working around that because obviously this thing is going to block and now those of you who have you know watched other videos on my channel I think you already know what's coming. Say it with me, everybody. Two in the pink, one in the async. We need asynchronous computing. What does that mean? Well, if we look at our JavaScript or TypeScript code again, you know, we see this function here. Do it is gonna call do chili from the chill API. And then when it gets that value back, the return value, then it's gonna update the MB which is going to cause the view to update. So this is synchronous. It is synchronizing on this call. It needs, it gets the value out. It's going to wait on this call. And when it gets the value back, then it can update the view. Very simple sequence. Call do it. Do it calls do chili. Get the return value. Use that to update our view. But what about async? Well, in async, we got do it. And it is going to call do chili. We're going to give it the text. But we're also going to give it a little extra sauce. We're going to give it your, your good boy, a lambda function. We're going to give it a function. In the sync version, you know, do chili is going to call the message box and block on that. And then when it gets the result from that, we can return back. And then we can use that return value in the view. In the async version, 
we get this lambda in here. And what we're going to do, we're going to do two things. First of all, do chili is basically just going to touch off the task, the job to be done. It's going to return immediately. It's going to return. And then do it is going to GTFO. And so that's great. We don't block. We just return immediately. But like, how do we update the view in this case? Well, we gave this bad boy a lambda. And this lambda says, you know, this is updating the view. And it takes in the result of the operation. So what do Chili has to do before it returns is it's got to spin off another thread, the worker. And that worker thread is going to execute the message box. And when it gets its return value back, it's going to call the lambda that we passed in to complete the job. So instead of the job being all in the do it function, call the function, get the return value view. Now all do it does is touch off the task and give it another function to execute. So this is what you have to do with the return value once it is available. And that's the basics of how asynchronous works, right? There's, there's a lot of different ways to, to do it, um, but this is one of the simplest. You give them a callback. That's, you can call that the continuation routine or the completion routine or whatever you want to freaking call it. Now, you can do a little better than this. We can separate the error path from the normal flow. Uh, I mean, with a normal function, the way you do that is you could just throw an exception. Uh, you can't throw an exception from here because you don't even, it's not, like, in this function, it's not going to happen. It happens in a different thread later on, so you don't know whether it has an exception or not. Unless there was a problem, like, just actually initiating the asynchronous operation. You could throw an exception in that case. But usually, the error is going to happen when you're doing the actual meat of the processing. You can't throw an exception from here because you just throw the exception in this thread, it's just going to crash the whole program. Right? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, you got to get that information back to... So, the way you can do that, a very clean way of doing that, is you give your boy two lambdas. You like lambdas? How about two lambdas? One lambda is going to be called when things succeed. We call that the accept function. And one lambda, you only call if things kind of go south. You call that the reject function. And so now our C++ function, instead of just taking in the text, it's also going to additionally take in two functions, accept and reject. And this is how we live our life. And if we do this successfully, we will have achieved one in the async. All right, let's get down to business. First, Let's update the front end, and then we'll support that in the back end. Uh, so there's a couple. There's one thing I just want to change here, make it a, a little simplification. Instead of having this kind of weird logic in here, uh, we're just going to make MB a string that can get rendered directly, and we'll pull the logic into the actual script part of things. That's that's probably cleaner. Should have probably done that to start with, but you know, it's interesting to show you can put logic in the template, anyways. So that means that your boy, MB's got to be a string. And it's not going to be like string or null. It's not going to be null. It's only going to be a string, never null. So we can just put the value right in here, like this. And then it will deduce that it is a string. And this MB will become type of string. Very good. OK. Now the chill API, do chili, is going to need a little work. First of all, it's not going to return a value anymore because you don't get the value right away. Uh, you get the value later in the, ex it gets submitted to the accept function. So, return void, put a new line in here, give it a little breathing room. Second parameter is going to be the accept function. We want to type that because we're in TypeScript. So we'll say that this is going to be the result. It's going to be a boolean in our case. That's what we get out of the text box. The callback is not going to return anything to the JavaScript or the, the C++ world. It wouldn't make much sense. So there you go. That's the type of callback that we accept in here. And the reject, that'll just take in a message as a string, provide a little feedback in there. And there we go. We have, we have successfully typed do chili to be an asynchronous function. Now, it doesn't make any sense to wrap this in a try catch because the exception is going to now come through the reject function. So let's just get rid of the try catch here. We can't do mb.value equals because do chili returns void. It is a void function, so that doesn't make any sense. Uh, first parameter is still the string, but now we need to give it some callbacks. So let's say it takes in button, and that's going to be you know true for if yes was clicked, false for no. 
So we can do mb.value is equal to btn question mark if it is true. Yes, if it is false, no. But what if they click cancel? Well, if they click cancel, again, that is going to be an exception, but we go through the reject path now. And so we'll say that there's the message in here, but we will not use the message right now. Actually, yeah, we'll just put, we'll just set the uh, MB equal to whatever message comes out of the exception and that'll be fine. Let's just do a quick little run here just to make sure, yeah, it works fine. It starts off null. If we click it, it's probably not going to be good for us. So let's not do that. Now we don't even need the parentheses in here. So clean. I do love the JavaScript Lambda functions, the closures, whatever you want to call them. They're very nice. All right, now on the C++ side, we need to, we need to engineer some stuff here. Uh, so first of all, we're now not going to have one argument. We're going to have three arguments. So arg pointer 0, 1, 2 will need to be read. Um, we're going to need to execute message box in a different thread. And we're going to need to store or somehow transfer to that thread scope the callback pointers because they will have to be executed after we're finished with the message box and we get the result. Now with asynchronous stuff, you can have multiple asynchronous operations in flight, you know, concurrently. So we probably want some kind of a structure to store those, to keep track of them. So we'll do struct invocation. Well, certainly has a p accept, has a p reject. So those are going to be our callbacks. And I want to use std async as my thread pool to do these tasks because it's very, it's very easy. I can just use it. So when you invoke something on std async, you get a future and you have to hold on to that future. You can't like destroy it because that'll block. So std future, I guess I need to include the future. Then I can do std future void task. All right. So these three things will form an invocation and we can create a map for our invocations. We'll include unordered map and then down here, let's get, make a little private section. Uh, so we need a unique ID for each invocation. That's easy enough. How about uint 32t next invocation ID? Initially set that to zero and instead unordered map mapping uint 32t to an invocation type. So let's do like auto and invocation is equal to invocations next invocation ID plus plus post increment that. That'll get us a reference to the current invocation and put it in the map, just a default constructed boy. So empty task, empty future and empty pointers there. We can do like invocation dot p accept is equal to, and that will be arg pointers at one. p reject is going to be equal to arg pointers two. Invocation dot task is equal to std async. We're going to launch our asynchronous task here. We need a function. Text is equal to arg pointers at zero pointer to get string value dot to string. So we'll capture that in the lambda. Let's do const auto ID is equal to this. So we'll, we'll store off the ID here. We'll use that, create it in the map. We'll also capture ID in here. Then we have a lambda that doesn't take any parameters. It just captures two things. That seems okay to me so far. What is this task going to do? Well, this is where we're going to put the logic. So we can maybe just copy and paste all this stuff, put it in here. Now we don't need arg pointers. We can just do string. Now we don't set exception here. So if the return value is id cancel, we want to call p reject. So we can do invocations at id dot ah. We need to capture this. We need to capture here. We need to capture the this context of the current object. Then we can have access to invocations. Use the ID to look it up. Dot p reject 
point or two, execute function, or execute that function. We don't need to give it a object to execute on because it's not a member function. Doesn't need a this. And the arguments, so we got to give this bad boy the string. Arguments come in as a Ceph v8 value list, which is actually just a type def on a vector of ref pointers, but we'll use this version of it. So we create a Ceph v8 value, create string, and we'll just say can for cancel. That'll be the exception string that we return. And we do basically the same idea in the non-cancel case we're going to call p except and this one doesn't take a string it takes a bool so create bool so if the return is equal to id yes then it must mean that they must click the yes button because if they clicked cancel or the x then it would be id cancel and if they didn't click yes then it would have to be no and that would be false so this is fine so this will post this lambda as a task to thread pool managed by the standard library it'll execute on a different thread we keep a reference to that execution with the future, and we can return immediately. And once the user clicks on the message box button, then in the different thread, this will return, and it will execute the appropriate function in the JavaScript context. And the rest of the operation will complete. The, uh, the view will be updated. This is pretty, pretty good, pretty beautiful, pretty clean, standard stuff. Um, there is one slight problem with it. The problem is it doesn't really work. Well, you see, we clicked here. We got the message box. So, so far, so good. Now, interestingly enough here, this is good. Like, even with this message box open, we can interact with the UI. So now we're no longer blocking the JavaScript. Um, but we click yes. So nothing happens. This does not get updated. It's as if our callbacks aren't being executed. But I mean, if we, if we make sure that child process debugging is on, put a breakpoint here, it does get hit. So we know it is it is executing this code, but it is, the, the effect is not happening. So, so what's the MF and problem here? Well, that's going to be for another video. And this is where we get into the, the real deep stuff. I think it's possible to understand at least one. There's, there's multiple factors in why this isn't working. One of them is possible to understand just from the information that I've presented already. So if you if you want to do that, you can you can you can ponder that puzzle yourself before watching the next video if you want. But that's going to do it for this video. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please click the like button. It helps a lot. And I will see you again with some more Nanosef.